Joint Public Information Meeting. Thank you all for joining us today. I am Aditi. And I'm Charlotte. And we are both docents and FOM's overall co-heads of docent training. Yeah. In order to ensure that the slides run smoothly, may we please request you to keep your videos turned off and your mic on mute. We would now like to invite FOM's president, Garima Lalwani, to say a few words. It's over to you now, Garima. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to FOM's Public Information Meeting, or PIM. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about FOM and what we do. It is heartwarming to see such a great turnout. As many of you may know, FOM stands for Friends of the Museums. And indeed, we are friends of many museums in Singapore. We are a volunteer-run, registered, nonprofit society that offers guiding services to the museums, art, and heritage institutions in Singapore. We also organize programs to enhance the community's knowledge of Asia's rich history and culture. Now, FOM was founded 43 years ago in 1978, primarily to provide guiding services for one museum, the National Museum of Singapore, also known as NMS. When we started, we only had 100 members. Today, we have more than 1,600 members who hail from about 50 different countries. While we offer many activities for our members to get involved with, providing guiding services is our core activity. Did you know that the first formal dose and training program was held in 1980 with only 11 trainees? Today, we have 450 docents guiding at 11 museums, art, and heritage institutions and trails. At FOM, we care. We care for our trainees, for our docents, for our visitors. We are inclusive in our efforts. And I want to share with you that just like many of you here today, I too started my journey with FOM by attending a PIM event more than a decade ago. Of course, that was an in-person event. But for me, joining docent training and becoming a docent has been a very rewarding experience. The training helped me discover my roots. It also made me look at other cultures, other parts of the world and people that I had not given much thought to with new understanding and respect. When I was training to become a docent, I encouraged my family to go on many of my tours. Being exposed to museums in Singapore from an early age made my children develop a lasting love for museums. And I can tell you from personal experience that learning is addictive. Many of us, once we get the taste, end up guiding in multiple museums. Besides the learning aspect, Thanks to FOM and Dosen Training Program, I have many, made many friends, some of whom have become lifelong friends. So joining our Dosen Training Program is not just about guiding, it is also about being part of a community, a community with diverse backgrounds and life experiences from different, different countries. What we all have in common though, is a love for learning and volunteering. I hope all of you will join us and become part of our community. Our training team has put together a very informative program for you today to help you decide which museum to sign up for. If you were to ask my views on which museum to choose, I would say, listen to all the presentations and pick the museum that resonates the most with you. I look forward to welcoming all of you on the first day of Tosin training in the near future. Thank you. Now back to you, Charlotte and Aditi. Oh, thank you, Garima, for such a heartfelt welcome and introduction to FOM Docent Training. So our guests are here today to learn more about our docent training programs. So it's probably a good idea to start with looking at the word docent. As you can see, 
Here are two definitions provided by dictionary.com and we would fall under the second one. A docent is a knowledgeable person who conducts visitors through a guided tour on various exhibitions. Now the root of the word comes from the Latin docere, which means to teach. Well, that all sounds quite formal to me. So why don't we consider what being a docent means to us? So Aditi, what would you consider the attributes of an FOM docent? That's a great question, Charlotte. There are docents and then there are FOM docents. Fueled by a passionate curiosity, the FOM docent is incredibly knowledgeable. Their enthusiasm is infectious and combined with their fabulous storytelling skills, manage to engage and educate audiences of all ages and from every walk of life. Those are nice ones. Now, I also think our FOM docents embrace research with a love of learning and conversing with our visitors. This evolves into them becoming an ambassador for their museum, for FOM, and for Singapore. But there's so much more to it, don't you think? Maybe our guests are wondering what they um, would gain or why they would want to become an FOM docent. There are so many reasons to become a docent. To begin with, you will gain a deeper and broader understanding of Singapore and in fact, the region. If you're an expat who has lived here for a short period of time, you will get to learn all about the gorgeous art, fascinating history, cultural heritage, and the diverse people that populate this part of the world. And if you're a Singaporean, born and bred on this little red dot, you may find yourself looking at your home country with a fresh perspective and might even fall in love with it all over again. You will also learn much from your visitors who will be from all over the world. They may share personal anecdotes or an interesting piece of information. You'll find these interactions and conversations highly enriching. Which brings us to the next point. Becoming a docent is wonderful because of all the new people you will get to meet. Now it starts with your training cohort, expands to the docent community at that institution, and then to the wider FOM docent community. You'll make friends from so many different places and backgrounds, all with a shared interest in Singapore and our region's culture. And we are cert certainly not an all work and no play kind of group. As an FOM docent, in fact, even as a trainee docent, you will find yourself meeting up with your friends for super fun lunches and relaxing cocktail evenings, which were even enjoyed virtually during these COVID times. You may also end up joining friends on exciting trips to places of cultural significance in Singapore and beyond. And as much fun as that all is, our docents are community minded as well. Being an FOM docent allows us to give back to Singapore, this little red dot that we all call home. Our docents are all volunteer guides and they really bring the museums, heritage institutions and heritage trails to life with their tours. Which leads us to where the current docent training opportunities are for this year. FOM docents lead tours through 11 different places. Like I mentioned, museums, heritage institutions, and heritage trails. And that repertoire is growing with a couple different pilot programs, hopefully underway soon. And this will allow for even more future training opportunities. Now this upcoming year, we have four different places that are running docent training programs. There's the Asian Civilizations Museum, ACM, the Indian Heritage Center, IHC, the National Museum of Singapore, NMS, and Sun Yat-sen Nanyang Memorial Hall, S-Y-S-N-M-H. Now these are all so different and you may find yourselves in a bind choosing between which one to apply to 
because they may all appeal to your personal interests. But before we delve into the individual museums, we want to share more about the nature of docent training as it applies across all of the programs. So let's give you the big picture first. Here are the start and finish dates for all four museums offering docent training programs this year. ACM, IHC, and NMS all begin training this September. And while IHC's lectures end in January next year, ACM and NMS finish a little later in March. At SYS NMH, training begins only in February 2022. At all museums, once lectures have concluded, you'll get roughly two months to prepare your very first public tour. On successful completion of this tour, your training would have come to an end and you'll be ready to begin life as an FOM docent. Besides getting all public holidays off, we also get a week off in October, three weeks in December, and a week long break for Chinese New Year. For those with young children, you may want to take note that our holiday dates largely overlap with those of major international schools in Singapore. The docent training page on FOM's website will have all these important dates for easy reference. Now that we have the big picture, let's get down to the specifics. All docent training sessions take place on weekdays and you will be required to attend the sessions twice a week. Lecture days at ACM, NMS, and IHC are scheduled on Tuesdays, while on Thursdays or Fridays, at each of these museums, you can expect to go on a field trip or follow experienced docents on special tours. If you plan to train with SYS NMH, your training sessions will be on Wednesdays and Fridays. You may now be wondering what, what is the cost of these programs? Well, training fees for ACM and NMS is at 550 Singapore dollars. At IHC, it is $350, while at SYS NMH, it's 280 Singapore dollars. Quite reasonable for the many benefits you will get by joining our docent training program. Now, we do not doubt that you would have some expectations of our training programs. So here's what docent training will provide you. World-class lectures by well-researched docents, published authors, and possibly university professors. Field trips with specially curated tours to enhance all that you're learning through the lectures and reading. You will have specialized deep dive tours in the galleries of the museum to learn more about a specific aspect of history or culture, art, the people, and so forth. You'll get to meet some of the curators and NHB staff to learn more in depth about the museum's artifacts and flow, and even hear little known gems of information you may want to include in your tour. Through this, you will have a compassionate group leader there to help you hone your guiding style and skills in order to apply what you're learning to the art of being a docent. And newfound friendships will develop within your groups and your cohort, and that will expand as time goes on. So you're going to gain an entire new friendship community. Now, these are just some of the aspects of the overall experience, but in exchange, there are some expectations we have of our trainees as well. Indeed, each of our programs has its own attendance policy. You may miss only a few sessions in the training period without consequence. Our programs are rigorous and attendance policies ensure you can keep up, fulfill your obligations and graduate with your cohort. We recommend that you sign up only when you know that you will be able to meet the attendance requirements for your preferred museum. Each week, you will be asked to do some reading 
which will often be given to you. These will be carefully selected and relevant to your museum. Sometimes though, you may wish to do your own research and that's absolutely okay too. Between the reading and lectures, you will need to complete artifact sheets, which will have to be handed in to your training team by a weekly deadline. Your attendance each week will include sessions to help build important guiding skills. This is done through the word of the week or the wow. This is an essential part of your artifact sheet. You will create a two minute oral presentation on a topic as you would guide it in the museum. Your training team will support you through this process as you develop your guiding skills and gain confidence in public speaking. In lieu of artifact sheets and wows, every so often will be a gallery talk. In this case, you will be assigned a certain number of artifacts to guide. These may be in the same gallery or floor of your museum. They will be presented within a small group of your peers and experienced docents who will help you with feedback and give tips to help you gain confidence. These gallery talks will further help hone your guiding skills and ultimately create a strong foundation when it's time for your first official public tour. Our public tours are being conducted a little differently this year. And given the many social distancing restrictions, so will docent training. That's right, Aditi. COVID-19 has created some challenges for all of us. FLM will follow all the rules and guidelines instituted by the National Heritage Board. Uh, for docent training, this does mean a few different things. So before COVID, we would break into smaller groups for those wow presentations that Aditi just mentioned, and then get back together as a whole for the lectures or the tours and so forth. Not this year. You will be assigned a group and it can be no larger than eight people. And that group must remain an island unto itself. So you can sit close together, but must be at least one meter apart from any of the other groups. There can be no interactions or intermingling between the groups throughout the training day. And the largest number of people allowed in a given space is 50 people. It goes without saying, masks will be worn at all times. But being mindful goes beyond wearing the mask. You must be careful within your group not to share things. You cannot pass things between you like asking to borrow a pen or passing around a picture of an artifact. You will see that the co-heads as well will be limiting the equipment shared between speakers. So each team will have a plentiful supply of alcohol swabs in order to wipe down anything touched by others um, as they're being used. This goes for things like microphones, computers, the mouse, pointers, even the audio headsets you may use. Now, often during training, there's a break with snacks. Anything self-serve buffet style or shared in terms of food or drink is currently not allowed. Now, these are the current set of rules today, and they may lighten up by the time training starts. So Aditi is going to tell us how they're being applied to our docent training programs more directly as we speak now. Like Charlotte said, the COVID-19 situation can very well change by the time we begin training a few months from now, in which case the current guidelines may change too. Consequently, this year, we are going to have to be flexible in our approach to docent training. And so, this year, our programs may take on a hybrid format. By this, we mean that the program will be delivered through a combination of in-person and Zoom elements. So you will be required to come into your museum on some days, while on others, training will be conducted online through Zoom meetings. However, each museum does have its own unique requirements. And so these combinations will differ slightly for each one. 
You may be wondering why in this age of the internet and Zoom meetings, do I need to attend in-person sessions at all? Well, the aim of our docent training program is to transform you into a great museum guide, guiding visitors live at the museum. In fact, FOM docents have been guiding at various museums since August last year with masks and the required safe distancing measures in place. And so it becomes crucial to build those important guiding skills in person. Coming into your museum often and regularly will help you as a trainee docent to form a strong connection with it, as well as with the artifacts that you will be guiding once you graduate. And finally, when you become an FOM guide, you also become a part of an amazing community. We have all leaned on each other virtually and sometimes in person during these strange times, which has made it all that much easier. You will find meeting each other in the real world to be hugely beneficial in the initial stages of the process of forming those new human connections. Many FOM docents will tell you that their closest friends belong to this community. And speaking of human connections, it's time to meet all our lovely co-heads of docent training this year. They'll tell us more about each of their museums. ACM will be led by Kate Mitchell and Laura Socha. At IHC, please meet Sukanya Pushkarna and Rama Srinivasan. At NMS, we have Lee Hongleng and Rupa Thamsit. And at Sun Yat-sen Nanyang Memorial Hall, there's Claire Henna and Tina Sim. So in case you haven't noticed, we're doing this in alphabetical order. And we'd now like to invite Kate and Laura to tell us more about the Asian Civilizations Museum. We are delighted to introduce you to the Asian Civilizations Museum. The ACM is considered a groundbreaking museum with 12 galleries that focus on decorative arts across Asia. Objects on display tell stories of the trade and the exchange of ideas that were the result of international commerce, as well as the flow of religions and faith through Asia. However, in our opinion, it should be your number one choice because, well, we're in the best location in the heart of Singapore. ACM Privé also serves great coffee and the happy hour is really tempting. And we host award-winning special exhibitions, including collaborations with the British Museum, Musée Guillemet, Beijing's Palace Museum, as well as internationally famous fashion designers. And now you're in for a treat as we give you a whirlwind tour featuring objects chosen by 10 of our ACM training team. So buckle up for the fastest tour in the history of FOM doses. Irina from Russia has chosen number 10. She loves this 19th century necklace from Southern India, which you will find in our spectacular jewelry gallery. She would love to wear it every day, but traditionally it would only be worn twice by the owner, once on her wedding day, and then once more when her husband turns 60. Coming in at number nine, Joe from Ireland wants us to dress to impress. This Chinese emperor's robe is the ultimate example of power dressing 250 years ago. Are you wearing bright yellow right now? If it was during the Qing dynasty, you would be in competition with the emperor, and that's never a good thing. At number eight, Paroma from India loves Chinese blue and white porcelain plates for their elegance. And if she lives in the 17th century, she might have gone bankrupt in pursuit of it, as many collectors did. How many influences can you spot here? This plate features Persian ladies, Chinese farmers and scholars, as well as flowers, which resemble Dutch tulips, all hand painted in cobalt blue on white porcelain. If you train with us, you will spot even more. Coming in at number seven is Michelle from the US of A. Do you ever wonder how people got from A to B before Google Maps? Michelle loves this piece because before mobiles or even maps, you could use this to navigate. 
is called an astrolabe and is an example of how Asian knowledge triggered the Western Enlightenment. At number six, Shriya from India would follow this statue anywhere. This statue of the Buddha from Thailand provides her with calming reassurance. Why? Well, if you look at the hand, this gesture is called a mudra, and it tells us to take a deep breath and not to be afraid. If you guide at the ACM, you will learn the secrets behind different hand gestures. At number five, Avni from Kenya loves this ninth century stone carving because it is a picture of domestic bliss. We see the Hindu god Shiva, his goddess wife and their boys, but Avni won't tell you about his happy family. Instead, she will tell the story about Shiva's powerful big toe. Can you see the trouble brewing under his feet? Avni wishes she had this superpower to stomp out the nuisances in her life. At number four, Leah from Colombia wants you to learn how to translate the museum labels. The label calls this a monumental ewer, which means a great big jug. However, Leah likes to call it the diva of the gallery. Our diva is unique and beautiful and even survived 1200 years in the seabed, but would it actually be fit for purpose? Imagine trying to pour wine out of it. At number three, Nikki from Korea in Germany has chosen this enormous 1,000 year old tile from Vietnam. Always up for a challenge, she loves guiding it because, well, no one else does. Mickey would ask the visitors, why do the dragons look like snakes? And why is it in the shape of a heart? Have a think about that. And if you spot Mickey at the museum, she might give you the answer. At number two, Kalyani from Singapore, who appears to be in ninja mode here, chose this small statue. Why did he make the list? This is one of the earliest statues of the Buddha found in the Malay Peninsula. She likes to imagine a Buddhist traveling around this region with this statue carefully carried in their pocket well over 1,000 years ago. And finally, number one, Heike from South Africa likes to challenge the viewer. How do you present a 2,000 year old statue like this to a group of 12 year olds? Well, she might get some of them interested in the jewelry or help others to spot the hidden mythological creature. But really the big question is, what are they actually doing and why? Join the ACM training and we will share with you their secrets as well as many others. How could you say no? I'm going to hand over now to the Indian Heritage Center. Thank you, Kate and Laura. Good morning, namaste, and vanakkam. I'm Brahma, and I, along with Sukanya, virtually welcome you all this morning to the Indian Heritage Center. Located in the heart of Singapore's colorful and vibrant Little India's precinct is the Indian Heritage Center or the IHC, which opened in 2015. The IHC celebrates and traces the history and heritage of the Indian diaspora in Singapore and the Southeast Asian region and how the early contacts between South and Southeast Asia go back over 2000 years. The galleries at the IHC focus on five major themes, starting from the early interactions between South and Southeast Asia, arranged chronologically to span the time period from the first century common era to the 21st century. The themes present the origins and migration of the South Asian community in Singapore, as well as the experience of South Asians in South Asia, especially Malaya and Singapore in particular. They narrate the history of the migrant community and their contributions towards making of Singapore as a nation. There are more than over 400 interesting artifacts on display that express this narrative in various ways. They highlight stories of rites of passage, attire, languages, religions, affiliations and festivals in the 21st century of the Indian migrants in Singapore. Hey Sukanya, why don't you share with all of us one such interesting story 
one of the star artifacts maybe from the IHC galleries? Sure, Rama, thank you. Hello, everyone. What you see is a gold necklace, which in Tamil is called Kasu Malay, where Kasu means coins and Malay is a neck ornament. This stunning piece of jewelry is from the estate of Santanam Victor Louis and the family of Nyana Prakasam Pillay, who had it specially made in Madras for his dear wife as a Christmas gift in the year 1914. The coins are Victorian half sovereigns dating from 1890 and its design is very unique. You can see 62 coins strung together with floral connectors which bear the French insignia of the fleur de lis and the engraved clasp is skillfully studded with rubies this Kasumale speaks of the influence of the European powers in the lives of well-to-do migrant Indian families. You must be wondering why this story is significant to the Indian Heritage Center. Well, Gyanam Prakasam Pillay was a trader from Pondicherry, South India, from a time when Pondicherry was a French colonial settlement. He migrated to Singapore, a British settlement in 1902 and became an established trader along the Serangoon Road. He owned two shop houses at number 40 and number 44 Serangoon Road, which are still prime locations. What an enterprising person indeed to be able to show his love for his place of birth, his current place of domicile and his wife all in one beautiful piece of jewelry. If you like fun stories yeah. like this mm -hmm. and are curious to know more, then do plan a visit soon. Stroll through the yeah. neighborhood mm -hmm. of Little yeah. India and discover its hidden gems, the many traditional delights, delectable cuisines, and of course, the treasures inside Indian Heritage Center. We promise you that this will be a memorable visit and we may even tempt you into joining the training to be a docent here. Thank you and see you soon. I will now hand the mic over to the friends at the National Museum of Singapore. Over to NMS. Thank you, Sukanya. Good morning. My name is Rupa Tamzit and I'm here today with my fellow co-head of training, Hong Leng. Welcome to the National Museum of Singapore affectionately known as the Grand Dame of Singapore's architectural heritage, our much loved and oldest museum in Singapore started life over a century ago as a Raffles Library and Museum. Today, the National Museum of Singapore still retains that old world heritage and charm, but you might be surprised to find out that it holds a very contemporary accolade for showcasing one of the largest self-supporting glass structures in the world, which connects the old colonial building to the modern new extension, allowing visitors to enjoy the exterior of this iconic dome up close while still being inside a museum setting. So imagine spending days, in fact months, exploring this beautiful Singapore landmark and learning about Singapore's fascinating 700 year history. Now, most of us know at least a little of the history of Singapore, some more than others, but let us help you to get a better understanding and acquaintance with the history that lies within these walls through three very simple questions. First, let me ask you, which of these national museum artifacts is, is a Singapore national treasure? The gold jewelry, the Singapore stone, the portrait of Swetanam, governor of Singapore in 1901, the mace, the portrait of Sir Stamford Raffles. Well, the answer is all of them. Singapore's national treasures form an important part of Singapore's heritage, helping us to get a better understanding of the Singapore story. A treasure can be a museum, a heritage institution, or one of the 200,000 artifacts and artworks currently held in the national collection. My next question, who was the founding father of colonial Singapore? Sir Stamford Raffles, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, Sangmila Utama, 
or Major William Farquhar? Well, the answer, of course, is Sir Stanford Raffles, but you may be surprised to hear that it's also Major William Farquhar. You see, when Raffles discovered Singapore in 1819, he was accompanied by his old friend, Major William Farquhar. And when Raffles left Singapore the very next day after signing the Treaty of Friendship and Alliance, it was Farquhar who stayed behind and made Singapore into a vibrant, successful port and settlement. And today, historians finally recognize that he was indeed one of the founding fathers of colonial Singapore. I'll now pass you over to Hong Leng. Thank you, Rupa. And here is the third question. How many trees were planted in the first 50 years after 1965 as part of the Garden City Plan launched by Mr. Lee Kuan Yew? 55,000, 500,000, 1 million, 1.4 million? Well, if you said 1.4 million, you're right. And N Parks recently announced that a further 1 million trees will be planted in the next 10 years. Well, we could keep going, but let's tell you a little bit about the training program itself. The National Museum of Singapore Dawson Training involves a six month program of lectures and field trips, giving us a fascinating glimpse of the history of Singapore from ancient 14th century settlement through colonial times to the modern global green city admired by the world today. We learn about the diverse ethnic communities of Singapore, the development of the port city during ancient and modern times, and we see the emergence of strong and visionary leaders who shape the future of the nation. Our learning is facilitated through a series of curated lectures delivered by some of Asia's top scholars and researchers in their fields. Academics from NTU, NUS, Yale and US and other institutions share their knowledge and insights into the history of Singapore, making this a very unique program. Another big difference is the weekly field trips which accompany the lecture series. These trips will take you on a journey of discovery and delight around Singapore, often to places that you didn't even know existed. And even our Singaporean colleagues have been surprised and delighted by these. Now, with NMS, your learning journey will continue indefinitely if you so choose. As once graduated, you can train for and guide one of the level two galleries or one of the special exhibitions. What's more, through those and ongoing training, the opportunities for personal growth and development are endless. And I might add that we're really a friendly bunch. So fear not, it's not all hard work, though there's a fair bit of that. So come and join us as a trainee docent with NMS. We promise you will never look back. Thank you. And now I will hand the session over to our colleagues at the Sun Yet Sen Nanyang Memorial Hall. Good morning, I'm Tina. Uh, my co-head of training, Claire, and I welcome you to join us at Sun Yat-san Nanyang Memorial Hall. Claire is not in Singapore right now, but has recorded this message for you, especially from the UK. Claire, and I'm a docent at the Sun Yat-sen Nanyang Memorial Hall, and I'd like to take some time today to tell you a little bit about our museum. Now, I know that you're all sitting there thinking, boring, it's so boring, it's about Chinese history, it's about Chinese politics, um, it's lots of long names, and it doesn't interest me at all. Well, think again, because actually, I think it's more about social history. And in true docent style, what I'd like to do is to tell you a little bit of a story today. And this is a story of two little boys. The first little boy is the hero of our story, actually. His name is Sun Yat-sen. And he's born in 1866 in Guangdong province, which is in the south of China. And he's born to an extremely poor family. His father is a subsistence farmer, um, has a tiny pocket of land, and really just grows what he can for the family to eat. And sometimes, of course, it's not even that much. And anything that's left over, he sells, and that money actually mostly goes in taxes and in tithes to the Qing government. And of course, Sun yat sens father's not alone. Most of the people in that region are extremely poor. They're all living this poverty-stricken, subsistence-style life. And as Sun yat sen grows up, he realises actually this isn't fair because 
we're giving everything to the Qing government and the Qing government actually isn't giving very much back. In fact, what the Qing government's doing is putting more and more rules and regulations on things. And for us today, it's remarkable actually that the Qing government even dictated what hairstyles people wore. And we all recognize the Chinese pigtail, the queue, all dictated by this Qing government. And as Sun Yat-sen grew older, he realized that this wasn't the way, the only way, that there were other ways um, to be. And he uh, was uh, particularly an advocate of democracy. And he realized that he could do something about it. And in fact, he dedicated his life to doing something about it, to helping his people get out of this poverty trap and get away from this, what he saw, corrupt Qing government. Now, I just mentioned another little boy as well. This other little boy was born 40 years later, and his name was Pu Yi. And Pu Yi was born to be emperor. In fact, at the age of two, he was taken from his parents and he was put into a most beautiful palace in Beijing, a multi-roomed palace with... Um, and he actually he lived a life of complete and utter luxury. We can't even imagine it. He would have banquets every day of 40 courses. He would have brand new clothes every day, um, all handmade for him, all hand embroidered for him, beautiful silks, beautiful fur, beautiful wool. Um, and he really lived a life of luxury. He was considered a divine being. So of course he could do no wrong. He could do whatever he wanted when, whatever, whenever he wanted. And as emperor, he was head of the Qing dynasty, and he was actually head of this Qing government. And in 1911, 1912, these two worlds collided. This Sun Yat-sen world of injustice and, and um, poverty collided with this world of Puyi's luxury, uh, of money grabbing, really. It was taking money from, or his government was taking money from the poor. The two worlds collided and we had the Chinese revolution. Now, of course, at that time, Sun Yat-sen was in his 40s. Puyi was actually just still a small boy. He was only four years old uh, when the abdication was forced on him. Uh, it wasn't him that signed the papers, of course, it was his stepmother. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that Sun Yat-sen Nanyang Moral Hall is not just about politics, it's not just about names or about um, dates and uh, times in history, it's about people, it's about what happened to them and how it happened and why it happened. Um, and we get to tell this fascinating story in the most beautiful villa in Belestier. We walk around its fantastic rooms and bit by bit we build on what happened, why it happened, what the outcomes were. And we get to explain why Sun Yat-sen was in Singapore. We get to talk about his friends that he met here. Um, and in fact, their stories are a whole different story that would take another time to tell you. Um, I would urge you to come along and find out all about it, to find out about the people, to find out about how Singapore um, influenced and helped in the Chinese revolution, but also um, how that Chinese revolution has impacted um, Singapore going forward and in fact still has ramifications today so please come along please come along to one of our tours um, and please please think about being a docent and then you get to tell the story in your own way uh, which is great fun okay thank you very much bye bye so do come join us at the Sun Yat-san Nanyang Memorial Hall to learn more about the revolution that made modern China today and also about the history of the Chinese community in Singapore and their immense contribution to neighborhood. Uh, I think you will discover many surprises as I did even as a native Singaporean. I will now hand you back to our co-host, Aditi and Charlotte. Thank you, ladies. Each program sounds fantastic. So what are you waiting for? Applying for our docent training programs is very easy. When applications open at 3 p.m. today, simply go to www.fom.sg and fill out the docent training application form. Next, the co-heads of the museum you apply to will be in touch to set up an appointment for an interview. After the interview, wait for a few days to be notified regarding the outcome. Do note here that acceptance into the course will not be on a first come first serve basis. And while you do not need to be an FOM member 
to apply for the docent training program, should you be accepted, you are required to take membership before you begin the course. Charlotte,